to the Dissident Daughters podcast. I'm your host, Ada, and I'm here deconstructing my Mormon faith and making space for other women like me to do the same. If you don't know what a dissident daughter is, well, it's a woman who actively challenges an established political or religious system, doctrine, belief, policy, or institution. And that's why I'm here, to challenge the Mormon faith as an institution, its doctrine and policies. If you want to come along on this journey with me, stick around and we'll do some talking, laughing, maybe crying, (laughs) venting, deconstructing. We'll learn some new things, hopefully, and most importantly, be supported through this difficult journey. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to the Dissident Daughters podcast. I have somebody really special here with me today. I found you on one of the ex-Mormon groups. I don't know because I'm in a bunch of them on Facebook, but that's where I found you. Probably Mormon Stories. Are you only in the Mormon Stories group? Mm -hmm. That's the only place I am. Yeah. Okay. So that must have been where I found you. Um, And she has a really unique story. And um, we're just here to Mm -hmm. talk about some of the experiences and fun things that she's uh, (laughs) had in her life. The craziness. She's got a wild roller coaster of a life. (laughs) So I'm going to let you introduce yourself just tell us a little bit about, mm. you know, it's okay. Your puppy's wonderful. He doesn't bother me at all. Or she. It's a she. It's a she. She. Yeah. Voodoo. She's going to take a trip outside in a oh, second. I love your puppy. Just like, maybe just give us a little bit of background about you, where you came from, what, mm. I don't know, just a, a brief synopsis. This is not a Mormon story interview <laughs> of five hours long, right? Well, I am Nana Ride. I am the widow of Sergeant Corey Ride. Um, he's with the Utah County Sheriff's Office. It'll be nine years next week. Is his angel anniversary? He was shot and killed in the line of duty. So, uh, since then, my life. Um, well, I coded the day I was notified of his death. And mm. um, so, okay, I, tell people what that means because a lot of people don't, don't okay. know what that means. Well, I'm a respiratory therapist, okay. and I was working at the hospital in the nursery with the babies, and I'm doing heart tests on them before they could go home. Okay. And I got a phone call um, notifying me that my husband had been shot and killed. Um, it was by a friend, not by the sheriff's department. So oh it wasn't. Gosh. It wasn't like it should be. <laughs> yeah. So I I screamed from one side of the hospital to the next. I can't imagine that phone call. I just can't. Yeah, it was it was terrifying. It was terrifying. But as I screamed, I heard him tell me, whatever you do, don't be angry. Mm-hmm. And he also, um, later when the sheriff came walking in after they had coded me, which means they had to resuscitate me, okay. put me back. Okay. So my heart stopped. I stopped breathing. I touched the veil, came back, and all my heavenly gifts had popped open. And I, wow. I could hear Corey tell the sheriff the dash cam was on clear as day and then the sheriff walks in the room and I tell the sheriff hey Corey says the dash cam was on Mm -hmm. and he says no there's no way that could happen because it was a new car it was a new computer system like and he wouldn't have turned it on for this or something he would have manually had to turn it on Ah, yeah okay yeah yeah you've remembered really well (laughs) yeah I've listened to all your podcasts yeah 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 so anyways they, they actually did go back and find that the dash cam was on that Corey had turned it on, and that's how they found out what was going on. But from that day forward, I started to see spirits in the daytime with my eyes. I started to have more dreams. I started to hear things, smell things, feel things. I felt haunted and terrified at that point in my life. And I was super LDS at this time. I was born and raised in the church. Mm -hmm. So um, I I was the kid that got knocked up at 15 and... (laughs) I was the chew that bubble gum that no one would ever want, yeah. you know, so I had because to Because your parents never talked to you about sex yep. and you thought, well, we're not going to use protection because we're never going to do that. And then, you know, I didn't even I know what read, that was. It, right. Honestly. It's just like the classic yeah. story. Yes. I'm sorry. It yes. happens so much. Okay. Yes. So, so then you're, then you're a used chewed up piece of bubble gum. That's right. And yeah. so I got married when I was 16 years old and Oof. was married to him for 10 years. Went to the temple for the first time when I was 19. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, yeah. And back then, it was the slit your throat, disembowel oh, yourself, like yeah. all of that stuff. At 19 years old to do those, I was horrified. Really horrified. I was yeah. horrified. Yeah. I never had to do those. Oh. I went through in 97, so they had stopped yeah. that part. But I was still horrified. Like, yeah. it's still horrifying. Yeah, yeah. Even without that stuff. But that's like a step above. So you have a few children with him. Three, did you say? I had with your first husband, yeah, three, three children. With my first husband, okay. and then Corey and I. Um, and then you met Corey, married him. Well, I had a second husband. 
Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Before Corey. Before Corey. Okay, okay. I'm yeah, so yeah. sorry. I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> no. That's okay. We can forget that one. <laughs> it was just three years it and it was a not short good. Blurb. <laughs> it was the I hate God years, you know? And oh my yeah. gosh, that's yeah. funny. Well, okay. I think it's so funny because like you're telling me your life story and I'm thinking, wow, she's experienced a lot in like, you're not that old. <laughs> Very young, and I'm like, oh, that's because you started at 15. It's true. Yeah, yeah. I, I lived yeah. a lot Marriage of life. At 16. Yeah, you yeah. lived a lot of life yeah. in, those, yeah. in those years. Okay, <laughs> so the second husband, short period of time, and then you meet Corey, who is, Corey. was a highway patrolman. No, Utah County Sheriff. Oh, Utah County Sheriff. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. No, you're good. Okay. Yeah, no worries. And and I was actually at a March of Dimes jail in Vail on Center Street in Orem. Okay. At the Smiths. That's, that's where you met him? That's where the jail was. Yeah. So <gasps> I was part of a country radio station called KWJJ. Oh, I and totally recognize I the was name a, of that. I was a JJ girl. Oh my gosh. So I, I got, you know, we did calendar and I was yeah. like June and then my picture was like on the, the front cover oh of it or whatever. Oh my gosh, how funny. That all 12 of us showed up to this March of Dimes jail in Bell and we had to ride along with a police officer to go fake arrest somebody and then they had to pay no. and get sponsors from their friends to get themselves out of jail you know oh for my the march gosh, of dimes how funny okay so all these girls saw Corey and thought oh he had these royal blue eyes and this beautiful smile and it's like oh i want to ride with him and i'm like i don't because i was not about men at all i just got out <laughs> of the had bad, some bad experiences right yeah i was surviving with my three sons and it was like mm, oh, yeah. no yeah so I did get stuck with Corey. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is that, that my bishop, who used to live across the street from my mom and dad's house, uh-huh. was Bishop Ride. Oh. And so I saw Corey's light, or name on his, by his badge, and it said C. Ride. And so I went to go get in the car, and I said, so what does the C. Ride stand for? And he goes, deputy. And I was like, oh, great. He's a dick. Oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he was related to the bishop? Yeah, they're cousins. Oh, they're, they're cousins. actually cousins. How funny. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so ba- bad <laughs> first impression, but somehow you ended up marrying him. <laughs> bad first impression. And it took us a minute to like warm up to each other. And then once we did, it was like game on because it was all I could do to, I love to embarrass him. He could turn uh, cherry red in a second. Yeah. So then you marry and you have a couple more kids with him and you were married... 19 years, right? 19 years, yeah. We had a son and a daughter together, and Corey adopted our children. Our, okay, my your previous, three others. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you just made this beautiful life together. We did. Yeah, we moved into his 100-year-old farmhouse. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, In Benjamin. It was the house that his I dad was Benjamin. born and raised in. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so it's the original pioneer home, you know, that... They came across the plains and built. Oh it was 700 square feet, and we raised our five children in a 700 square foot, one bathroom. No way. No heat. We would heat the the house by opening our oven door. No. Yeah. You didn't even have like a fireplace. We had a, a coal stove or a you know wood burning stove. Oh yeah. But his cousin um, had lived there like years before and had put the stove in there. And he wanted it back, so he took it. Oh my god! So we didn't have one, and um, yeah, oh we, we lived there for fifteen years, and we were we were so dirt poor, like mm. so poor. Hmm, that's so crazy. You're like, I don't know how we survived. I don't even know. Yeah, yeah. He, he worked three jobs. I worked. Aww. I went to school, became a respiratory therapist, and then worked better jobs. And yeah, okay. So fifteen years before he was killed, I had a dream he would be shot and killed. Woke up screaming, and he just, you know, would tell me, you know, it's okay, I'll be super safe, I'll, everything's fine. Yeah. And then I didn't have another dream until three years before he was killed. Had it, had it again. Woke up the same way. Um, he was next to me and told me, it's okay, I'm a Sergeant Eagle Mountain, it's fine. You know, I'm safe. I have a desk job. I'll be, I'll be oh, fine. Oh, yeah. And then I had the dream again a year before, and same thing. But I think at that point in time, his. He, he, his antennas were coming up and he was really? like, yeah, yeah. He, he was starting to experience some, some ghosty things himself that really? were paranormal in our house. Mm. And like, he was super cynical and didn't believe in anything like that. Mm-hmm. But when we had built our new home, so we had been in our home two years before okay. he was killed. Okay. And so we built next to the hundred year old farmhouse, this beautiful 2,700 square foot home, four bedrooms, three bathrooms, like wow. just beautiful yeah. we picked everything together 
but I, I kept telling him that there's some kind of vortex in our kitchen. I don't know if it went with the land or what, but like I would hear voices all the time and people moving around in the kitchen. Oh my, my kids gosh. would be like, there's a lady downstairs singing in the kitchen. <gasps> and I'd be like, I know I can hear her too. And so we would tell him and be like, yeah, whatever. You guys are so dumb. Like yeah. whatever. And then one day he, I'm upstairs and he calls me. He's like, Nan, get down here. And I'm like, what? What? Like, <laughs> he's like, watch this. And so we had um, black blinds that were wooden blinds. Okay. And the whole um, east side of our house was all windows. Okay. And so we had these black blinds that were in each window. Okay. And he was going along. He's super OCD. And he was like lining up all the strings, uh-huh. you know. Uh-huh. The ghost was going behind him and flipping them the other way. The whole entire things. And it was no not just way. one window, but it was like. Every window he tried to fix, it would flip the next one. He'd be like, watch this. He'd do it and it'd flip. And I just busted up laughing. I'm like, do you believe me now? Like, <laughs> He's like, I, so I have no explanation. Funny. I'm like, I am telling you, this house and this land are full of spirits. Just because you don't interact with them all the time doesn't yeah. mean they're not there. Yeah. Like this one wants you to know that she's here. Okay, because this is crazy because we're going off topic just a little bit. But we built a new house um, 16 years ago. But, like, my kids have always sworn that our house is haunted. I'm like, it can't be haunted. We're the first person people to ever live here, you know? Yeah. Like, I just assumed that, you know, hauntings only happened in old homes where, like, people used to live and something happened there, right? But my daughter has the same thing. So she has shutters in her bedroom. Mm-hmm. And she always closes them a certain way. And when she comes back in the room, they're always moved. And she always tells us, like, Mom, did you move the shutters? Nope. Dad, did you move the shutters? There's only three of us living in the home. <laughs> And I'm like, none of us did it. I think, I don't know, maybe there was like a breeze. <laughs> and and not, you know there's I, not. No, I know there's not a breeze. I'm just like, no way. And it keeps happening like day after day. Yeah. So yeah. that's so weird. So as soon as you told that story, I thought of that like, oh shit. And we also have a thing in our master bedroom ever since we have lived there. And I swear to God, it's been every single day since we've lived there. There's a knock on the wall. It's like this. Like that. Every night, almost the same time, where the hell is that coming from? Why don't you ask? I don't know. I never thought about it. I'm scared. What are you afraid of? (laughs) An answer? It'll probably stop if you ask. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, God. Um, Hello, if you're trying to get hold of somebody and they're paying attention and they can hear you knock... Yeah, I mean, this, if it's a spirit, they're very... Um, but what if it's a family member? What if it's a friend? What if it's somebody that just wants to get through to you so they know, they, they can tell you that you're not alone or you don't have to do this journey alone and it's hope and it's love. What if, what if, like so many what ifs, ask. Yeah, see, I'm afraid of those what ifs. Like I immediately go to, I don't want to know. And we kind of joke about it. We kind of, in the beginning, we said that like one of the construction workers got sheetrocked into the wall or something and he's stuck in there, you know, and we just kind of made this joke. And so we would always say like, oh, it's just the sheetrocker, you know, just knocking on the wall, like, please let me out, let me out. But I mean, 16 years later, he's still there knocking on the wall. Shouldn't you answer? (laughs) Like, that's really rude should to I make knock, somebody... Should I knock back? Knock or back or say? be like, hey, who is this? What do you want? I, I know Ooh. in our in our new home that um that we just sold to move to St. George, it it was two years old when Corey was killed. Okay. And um we had all kinds of spirits in there. All wow. kinds. Like, everybody had interactions with them. Like, I just told you about, you, you yeah. know, the shutters. But we would have... We call them stinkers. Okay. They would smell like cigarette smoke or something. We've never smoked a day in our life. I'm a respiratory therapist. I don't I don't even hang out with people that smoke. Like, right. you no. Know. But you would suddenly smell something that smelled like cigarette smoke? Oh, yeah. Oh, so, so we got, we got to the point where we're like, hey, you're welcome to stay here. But you can't but smoke. But your smell is offensive. Change your smell or you're going to need to leave. And they no. do. They change it right away. Boom. Are you serious? So you just have to. You have to talk you to know, them. Talk to them. Like they're a person because they are. Wow. So you can make a request. Why not? I don't know. I just I, never thought I, of I it that way. I do to Corey all the time. Really? Oh my gosh, yeah. I'll get into the car and I'll be like, hey, let me know you're there. Play me a song. Aww. Or, oh my gosh, about a week ago, it was a week ago, Brad and I were getting, we got into the car. I haven't been on my, my phone music at all, like mm-hmm. not in months and months. All of a sudden, my phone connects to the car, you mm-hmm. know, and... um. Hello again, hello by Neil Diamond starts to play. And I went to go turn it off and Brad grabs my hand and he says, no, stop. 
what if it's Corey? Aww. I was like, oh my gosh, because his angel anniversary is next week. Yeah. Like, what if it's Corey? And I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. Okay, whoa, whoa. Okay, so we're listening to it. And a few minutes later, like we can feel him in the car. And we're both Aww. bawling. And then the next song comes on. And um, he loved Metallica, and <laughs> yes. it was a Metallica song and an ACDC song back to back. Oh my gosh! And then, then Brad went into this gas station to get breakfast burritos. As he's in there, I say to Corey, "If it's really you, change this song right now, and let me know it's you." And then, the song stops. And Leona Lewis, who even listens to that? <laughs> okay, not me. I don't know. Um, Leona Lewis, I've heard of her. I am right here, and the album is Spirit. Shut up. I kid you not. I was just, I just got full of body chills. It's like, <gasps> it's him. Okay. Yeah. You can't make this stuff up. No. This is like <laughs> blowing my mind right now. So your husband dies. You have this experience where you, your heart stops beating. You stop breathing. Yep. You're like, do you remember like <laughs> something like people describe of a near death experience, like going towards the light or anything like that? <laughs> no, things just went black. I was in a black space. Okay. And then I remembered opening my eyes again and everybody I worked with was over the top of me. Okay. Okay. So you black out for a minute. So you don't remember anything from the other side of the veil, but something happened in that moment that just kind of opened you up to all kinds of oh, yeah. spiritual experiences. Is yeah. that what you would call it? Or I like to call it my heavenly toolbox popped open and oh. all of my heavenly gifts just went bursting out and it scared the crap out of me. Yeah. Because I started seeing things in the middle of the day. I started even seeing dark ones in the middle of the day and attached to people and going up the sides of walls and oh, actual my spirits. Goodness. That were showing me, you know, what happened to them and where their bodies were. And I'm just like, I don't even know what to do with this. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, that would scare I the nothing. shit out of me. I, it, it was terrifying. Completely terrifying. And I actually went to my bishop. Oh, okay. And he said, okay, Sister Wright, I think you have some real gifts. I don't know how to help you, though. I was hey, like, but awesome. he called them gifts? Yeah. Because I would expect a bishop to be like, um, maybe you need some psychological therapy. help. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you need some medication. But like they would think that something's wrong with you. But you're talking to me, right? Do I look yes. like I need psych- no. psychological help? No, not at I think all. that he could tell that when we were talking. Yeah. Like I was legit. Like, yeah, this is the stuff I'm you seeing. You crazy. And I'm not crazy. And this is real help. Like, yeah. what do I do? I don't know what to do with this. Did you think you were going crazy though? Was there a moment where you're no. like, you, so you knew it was real. You're like, I knew it was real. Not I just didn't know why. Mm. I knew it was real. I just didn't understand why. I thought I had done something wrong because oh. of, you know, my my belief system. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought I had done something wrong and yeah. that I was going to be haunted. And, you know, not only did I have my life shattered and my husband ripped from my arms, but my family ripped from my arms, but I'm haunted too, all at the same time. So oh, it was yeah. like, it was almost like all my shields were down and I was just getting bombarded or like I was on this really soft or fast merry-go-round mm. going round and round and round. I just couldn't get off. It was like... I don't understand. (laughs) Yeah. And like processing all of that and wrapping your brain around what's happening to me. And, and it makes perfect sense to me that that's the way you thought of it, that you were like being punished because you did something wrong, because that's exactly what's taught in the Mormon church. It's like, if you are having, like, if you're seeing dark spirits or if you're feeling dark things, that's because you brought something something upon yourself. Like it's always your fault, right? Absolutely. Yes. That's, and that's what so I thought. Crazy. Well, and then three months, I haven't even told you this, Ooh. three months after um, Corey was killed, I was called into the bishop's office and accused of adultery. No. Yep. Um, Wait a sec. <laughs> that's a thing? Like, how yeah. are you accused? Like, who told them? Did t- someone tell them something or yes. they just had a feeling? No. So apparently a man saw me on the news because back then I was on the news a lot. Huh? Man saw me on the news, told his wife that he was having an affair with me. What? And it got, she went to her her bishop, stake president, stake president, that stake president to my stake president to my bishop. I get called in because that's what a widow needs, you know, is mm-hmm. to have an affair. Yeah. Because that makes everything better. Yeah. What I was like, I was like, is this a joke? And he just was like, no, this is very serious. And I was like, can I at least see who the idiot is that's claiming that I've done these things? Uh-huh. I haven't done anything. Yeah. And um, he shows me, and when he pulls it up on Facebook, <laughs> it isn't even anyone that would ever be in my wheelhouse, ever. If you were the last person on God's green earth, would it ever be anyone that I would do anything with? 
ever. I and am I was just dying. like, I was like, seriously, <laughs> I am grieving the murder of my husband and you are doing this shit to me? Yeah. Really? Now you have to try and defend yourself from... Yeah. Gospel of love, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, so you had multiple kind of, yeah, it sounds like multiple bad experiences with the church after Corey died. You told me a little bit about a lunch. Was it a luncheon that you had with some of the members of the 12? Tell me yeah. about this. Yeah, so um, my daughter and I, we were we were invited by the um, all the apostles and stuff to go eat with them. Eat lunch with them. Because this was a very high profile, like everyone in the new, like I had heard of it. Yeah. Even though I didn't know you from Adam, but like I knew the story. I knew your husband was killed. I saw it on the news. Like everyone knew. And that's that adds to... All the stuff well, that you go through, it, right? It was, it was a 50-mile high-speed chase with with people shooting across I-15. Like, it was a big deal. They had just shut down the freeway. Oh, because for all of that after happening. him? Yes. Oh, see, I didn't know that so, part. there were roads closed down. There were cops coming from this every direction. This was after direction. he shot your husband, and then he took off. He took off. And cops were chasing him. Yeah, but they didn't okay. know who they were after until a couple of hours later because it got called in as a suicide, neglecting to see the eight shots in the front of the police car. <laughs> yeah, great police work there. Mm-hmm. And then, <laughs> then they don't even know what they're after. They don't know if it's a sniper or what it is out in the middle of nowhere until Corey comes to me after my near-death experience at the hospital and tells me to tell the sheriff the dash cam is on. That is when they found out who they were after. Oh my that gosh. is how they knew what had happened. Because it was all on video. So interesting. I mean, to me, that blows my mind because I'm like, well, duh. Why wouldn't they look at the dash cam footage very first? Because but they just turn assumed... it on. But if you if an officer pulls behind an, a car with their hazards on, they're just checking to see if they're okay, and that's all Corey was doing. Yeah, it was just but something in him made it made him manually turn it on. He knew something was up. He knew something was up. His spidey senses were going off, and he was just like. Flipping that on. And thank goodness, because yeah, now you have that it. was used in the murder trial, and we knew what happened. We knew how many times that girl tried to get away. She was driving. How many times she tried to pull out and get away, and how everything went down. It was all in video. Wow. So, But without Corey saying that, they probably never would have looked. Isn't that crazy? Okay. I got us off on a little yeah. bit of tangent. <laughs> but yeah, so, so, so leaders in the church, somehow yes. you're... Your story got out and they were like, hey, let's. So my 70, my area 70. Okay. He had set up this luncheon for us to go to. Okay. And all of the apostles were supposed to be there. Everything was supposed to be all set up. And we were excited. To me, I was like, if I ever needed to feel my Savior's love is now. Mm-hmm. You know, and to be mm-hmm. around the d- disciples of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. I I needed it. Like, yeah. I, I was literally drowning. And, yeah. and didn't know how to keep my head above water. Mm-hmm. I literally needed to fill my Savior's love. I'll be honest. Yeah. And so I went looking for that. And you took all your kids. I didn't. I took my daughter. Just oh, my just daughter. the daughter. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. So me, the daughter of the 70. Okay. So as we're going in, the double doors, the young women's president at the time, general young women's president at the time, came and met, you know, shook our hands and stuff. And my daughter mm-hmm. got a picture taken with her. A really super kind, nice lady. Like, the epitome of Jesus. Like, really? seriously. Aww. So, so, so sweet. Then D- Dieter Uchtdorf comes walking up. And he is short, just so you guys know. <laughs> I totally. He's like, you told me eight, that earlier. And I was like, seven, no way. Like, I totally yeah. picture him at least six feet tall. Yeah, he holds himself really big. But he is not <laughs> big at all. His ego's okay. big, though. That Maybe that's what you're feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he comes over and the 70 says, yeah, this is Sister Red. Her husband is the, the officer that killed and he's like hi and he, he shakes my hand and I I said ah you're you're one of my very favorite speakers and he laughs puts his head back laughing and then he says I'm everybody's favorite let's go with my hand and walks off and I'm standing there stunned here's someone in the first presidency of the only true church in the world mm-hmm. and he acts like that he never once said no I'm so sorry for your nope. loss nothing nothing because it's not like he didn't know who you were. They introduced you and said, this is the person who just lost her husband. And he's like, oh, <laughs> hi. No. Like, I'm everyone's favorite. Nothing. That sounds so arrogant to me. So arrogant. He, Ugh, he literally barf. went from my favorite to, to under your my least. shoe. Under your shoe. 
Yeah. Okay. So you know that S word we shouldn't say on the air. That one. <laughs> yeah. The S H one. Yeah, the S H word that you get in a pasture. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So then from there, then we went into the cafeteria, and um, where is this cafeteria? It's, like it's at the church offices or what? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea. Okay. Yeah, the church office building. Okay. Yeah. And and it's underneath, so I don't mm. I don't remember which tier we parked on. Okay. We just walked in from parking because we were right next to the door because he's a 70. Yeah. So okay. next to the door, we walked mm-hmm. right in the double doors, through another set of double doors into the cafeteria. Cafeteria. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, it, and we, we pretty much one by one had most of the apostles come over and say hello to us. Okay. Um, I got my picture. Well, we got our picture taken with um, Oaks. And <laughs> it's, What year would this have been? Just, um... No, it was 2014. 2014. Okay. Uh-huh. So, um, Monson was the prophet. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. I didn't see him, by the way. Oh, he, yeah. No. He was probably already. He, he was mentally. Yeah. Not... He was dementia and he yeah. wasn't really. Okay. I, I was told, yeah, he wasn't around. So. Okay. Yeah. He was having some issues with his health. Yeah. For a while there. So, then, yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I had met, um, Holland and I actually went to school with his son. Oh, really? So yeah, we were kind of in the same group. At Preble High School together. So, okay. Um, so is he the son that's a mission president in yes. South Carolina? He, he actually he actually was the president of UVU first. Okay, so you met Holland, you met Oaks, you met and all of them. Ballard. Yeah, okay. yeah. We we met all of them. There was I think there was only one or two that I didn't meet because they were in and out really fast. But was it like just a regular lunch that they always have on a Thursday afternoon, or yes. was it okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was nothing special. Were you kind of a guest, though? A, no. Like a guest of honor of any kind? Oh, no. No, no? we were just in a, t- in a back table and people... I, I was meant to think that. Ah, oh, But we okay. were we were just at a table and they, the 70 would go over and be like, hey, can you go over and... Oh, and say hello. Say hi to these guys. Okay. And and they would. They, they were kind, but like... You can fill egos. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. I know exactly and, what you mean. and some people have such big egos and really icky energy. I mean, I do energy mm-hmm. work and sometimes they're just sticky, gross, brown, oily energy. And you just like <laughs> need to wash your hands and have a light shower like right away. Oh, really? Yeah. I <laughs> can't want to know who has the yuckiest energy. I want you to tell me about people's energy. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story. Okay. So I've met Ballard. Okay. Um... I won't go into too much detail about how I met him, but um, conversations, been in a room with him, you know, Mm -hmm. talking and Mm -hmm. stuff. And I thought he was genuinely like one of the nicest people I've ever met. His son was gross. I'm sorry. Like I immediately felt a really bad energy from his son. It's not amazing. Yeah. I could feel it. He was gross. Yeah. I was like, he's a creeper. Yeah. He's not a good person. But I felt good energy from Ballard. So mm-hmm. I'd be interested to know what you see, felt from him. Ballard was the only one I felt good energy from. <gasps> really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I wasn't off on my no. on my reading. Oaks. <laughs> Gross. Um, That's the word that comes to my this mind. Wrong, but like he it's like he lived another life in the KKK. Like he oh felt God. not good. Yeah. Like forceful. That wouldn't surprise me. A no. forceful energy. Like, mm-hmm. um, like, I'm in charge, I'm the boss like he, kind of thing. He would make people do things oh, shit. his way and only his way. Yeah. Um, it, and I used to like him as a speaker. Like, I did. Yeah. Growing up, I did. Mm. I I named a son after him. No. My son is Shay Dallin. Oh, no. I'm yeah. so sorry. It, I actually told him that. And he says, well, <laughs> anybody named after me, you know, should be able to come have lunch with me, too. I was like, well, I'll tell my son. He goes, yeah, you help him just call my office and I'll let him, like, that'll That's ever so happen. so funny, yeah. Right? Yeah. He'll be like, Shay who, what? Yeah, whatever, good luck. There's you know? a lot of Dallins in Utah because right? of that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't, the, the thing is, is I was, I was needing to fill my Savior's love and I did not fill my Savior's love. There. Um, not there. That's a big deal because we are constantly being fed a story about who these men are. Yeah. And like, for all we know, they could be talking to Jesus every day. Like, that's what I was taught to believe. Like, oh, they probably have meetings in the temple with Jesus. So they would be so close to him. Yes. And yet 
you could be in a room with all of them and feel none of that. And, and I didn't. I, it was super, super disappointing. Really disappointing. So you walked away just feeling like that was not what I thought it was going to be? I I walked away feeling deflated and unheard. Oof. Oof. Like, yeah. I felt like I was screaming my pain at the mountaintops and no one was hearing me. Like, mm. I just needed to know that God was there. I just needed to know I could get through this. I just needed to see a path. And I didn't see one. And I didn't feel a gospel of love mm-hmm. at all. Not at oh all. Oh, my gosh. Okay, what you're describing, it's almost going to make me cry because I experience like, everything you're saying is exactly like the experience I had when my son left the church and then my husband left the church and I was drowning. Mm-hmm. Of course, I wasn't mm-hmm. dealing with death, that kind of grief. But, it, but I was grieving. dealing with grief. Yes. yes. And my bishop gave me tickets to general conference to Mm -hmm. be in the conference center. And I had never had the opportunity to do that before. And so I took me and my two daughters and we went. And I remember thinking, I need to feel my Savior's love. I needed that confirmation. Mm -hmm. I needed that validation that I was still on the right path, that I was still okay, that everything was going to be okay, that God loved me, that God still loved my husband and my son and all those things. And I went to that conference and I felt nothing. Nothing. I uh, felt totally deflated. Yeah. I kept, I kept like, it was like I was holding my breath the whole time, like waiting for somebody to say something profound. And then at the very end, the prophet got up to speak and I was like, this is my moment. This is when I'm going to feel it. And this is President Nelson. Mm-hmm. This is when I'm going to feel it. I'm getting chills right now because he got up and he essentially said, you all need to get your shit together because Jesus is coming soon. I mean, of course that's not. But basically, that's what he said, right? But it was like, he said something like, time is running out and blah, blah, blah. And I immediately just felt, no, that is not from God. Yeah. That is not God. That is not love. That is not anything. And I, it it was exactly like a deflating, like all the air just went out of me. And I left feeling like, whoa, I don't think those men are inspired. Yeah. That was probably my first step out. Yeah. Yeah. That's so So you're describing like, I mean, exactly. the way you're Same talking feeling, about it, right? Like, yeah. 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 It's terrible. And I didn't want to admit it at the time. I didn't say that to my daughters. Yeah. I, it was like on the way home. I'm like, wasn't that so wonderful? I did not think it was wonderful. And I don't know how they felt. I've never even brought that up to them. I wonder how they felt. Oh, you should ask them. That'd yeah, be interesting to know. Yeah. Yeah. So at the time, okay, you're just dying to have some like experience that from God to say you're okay and it's going to be okay because you're just drowning in this. Well, I, need, I needed it to make sense because oh, to me, yes. I mean, how do you make sense of death, you, you know, and especially murder Ugh. on a really good person that has lived his life right? Mm-hmm. How do you make sense of that? And to me, I've been married to this wonderful man that we've, we've made this life together, you know, and all of a sudden he's gone. Now what? Like, now yeah. what? You're just free I'm, I'm I'm just supposed to start over? Like, what? What happens? Do I get to talk to him again? Do I get to see him again? Like, what? Yeah. You know, you. I had so many questions. I, I was I was like, you know, those those little memes where the little kid's like, mom, 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 <laughs> mom, mom. I was like, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father. Hey, 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 hey. Like a billion yeah. times. Like, I just wouldn't let it go. I wouldn't let it go. And I think... Um, in, in a couple of days that um, I was made to wait um, to to see Corey's body, mm-hmm. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I couldn't do anything. I was still in my scrubs. I was in his sweatshirt and his hat. And I would go out and talk to the police officer that's, like, parked out front of my house day and mm-hmm. night. Talk to him. Like, I couldn't. I just couldn't cope. In my rational, unrational mind, I was like, he forgot his toothbrush and he wouldn't do that. Like, he wouldn't mm-hmm. go anywhere without it. You know? And... Like, it just made no sense to me. Yeah. And I was like, and I didn't get to say goodbye to him um, because the night that it was going on, the night that, or the next day that he was killed, but that night we had a microburst storm okay. and he couldn't sleep. So it was like three o'clock in the morning when I finally just gave him some airplugs because sometimes I'd work night shifts. Mm. I just gave him the airplugs because we both had to go to work the next morning. Yeah. And so when I got up to go to work, I had to check on at 6 a.m. and he was still snoring. Finally asleep. And I was just like, I'm not going to wake him up and say goodbye. No. So I didn't. 
So th- those couple of days, I just tortured myself because I didn't get to say goodbye. Ugh. And he had called me at noon and he was killed at one. But oh my when gosh. he called me, he told me how much he loved me, that he had made dinner in the crock pot, like, you know, all this stuff. And then all of a sudden he's gone. Like, I'm like, no, 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 you got to let me say goodbye. So the day I was going to get his body, I got into the shower and water is a conduit to the other side, just FYI. Mm, okay. uh, the shower starts to hit me, and then all of a sudden, it disappears. And I see this iridescent window, and he's standing in it, solid as I'm looking at you from the waist up. I can see tears in his royal blue eyes, and he smiles at me. My first thought was, you would come to me when I'm naked. <laughs> and he starts laughing. <laughs> Yeah. So Just you like didn't you say that did. out loud, but you thought it. I thought it. And he started laughing. He started laughing. So he can hear your thoughts. Yes, but I still didn't think that. And then I started to talk with my mouth. I said, I have so many questions I want to know about the guy that murdered you. I want to blah, blah. And yeah. I, I'm like, I'm pointing to my fingers, like one by one, you know, asking all these questions. And he talks to me with his mind, not with his mouth. And he holds up his finger and he says, shh, I only have a second. And I smack my butt down on the bench in my shower. And I said... I said, fine, what? Like a little bratty two-year-old, right? (laughs) And he reaches out and he pets the side of my face and he cocks his head and looks at me. And with his mind, he says, you are so beautiful. I love you so much and I will never, ever leave you. And the water starts running on me and he's gone. And I was like, whoa. And I fell to my knees and I thank God mm-hmm. for letting me say goodbye to him. Yeah. Cause that told me not only is there another side and I saw it with my bare eyes. Yeah. I talked to him. He said goodbye. And if I can do it once, I can do it again. Yeah. And so I was like, game on. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to, so gonna I work knew, I knew when I went to go talk to the apostles that I was going to get answers, right? Yeah. No, no, oh, zero. So here's a question and I don't know if you can answer it, but why does he only have a second? <laughs> and he says, I just have a second. Like, wait, don't ask me any more questions. I, I only have a second. Why? I, what is he I doing? Honest, <laughs> I honestly think, this is what I know, actually, okay. at the time. There's lots of stories. And it's in my book, by the way. <gasps> You're writing a book. I've written a book. Oh, you've written a it's book. It's in editing right now. It's called Gracious Grief. Oh, How my. How to embrace your grief and love yourself and others more deeply. Oh, so when is that coming out? Do you it's know? in editing. I'm okay. hoping. I'm hoping like by my birthday, April ish. Okay. I'm hoping. Um, um, say the name of it again. Gracious grief. Gracious grief. Okay. I'm gonna mm-hmm. watch for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you tell these stories in your book. I tell my whole like, <sighs> but there's miraculous stories in it. And yeah. so without killing all of the stories. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> there are lots of stories of people that were involved that day mm-hmm. that had interactions with Corey. After he was killed. Oh, no way. Lots of them. Lots. Hmm. And lots of other stories of people. So so if you picture a lake, you know, that's just super still and mm-hmm. you throw a, a, a rock. rock in the center and that ripple that's just goes from the center all the way out. Uh-huh. All the people that he touched in his lifetime, he's continued to help from the other side. And there's stories upon stories upon stories of him showing up in near death experiences. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, so it's not just family. And in a way, I've been really jealous because it's like, yeah. you saw him? Gosh, yeah. dang it. Yeah, do I'm to, sure. Do I have to die again? What's going on? Like, <laughs> Totally. I can totally understand that jealousy because it's like, well, why wouldn't he only come to me? But, and he does come I to need me. him. He comes to me all the time, you oh. know, and sends me, you know, sends me songs and birds and, oh, but it's unreal. Signs mm. all the time, all the time. But, like, he, he's still doing what he did on this earth, and that's saving people. That's helping mm. people. That's standing as a witness of good, yeah. you know, and he hasn't changed. There's so many stories. I can't even. Ooh, I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> and also, we, we should plug your podcast because ah. it is amazing. Tell us about your <gasps> podcast. My podcast is The Mormon Medium, and I've gotten a lot of shit for that. <laughs> <laughs> the kindness of the passion that you step in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I go by Mormon, but if you are an uptight Mormon and you don't like the name, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't think we have uptight remember, Mormons listening to my Remember, podcast. it's a win for Satan. So, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Her podcast is amazing. The, as soon as I found out about it, I started listening. I just binged 
And you only had seven episodes out, so I was like, I need more. I need more. It took me like 24 hours to listen to all seven of them. I was like, I got to, yeah. It's taken a life of its own. It's been super fun. So it's my husband's little baby. Like, it was his idea. I Ah. thought he was nuts. And I hate the sound of my voice. So it was like... It's like, oh, I didn't know if I want to do this, you know? Yeah. But like we had talked about topics and things that we wanted to talk about. And but we touch on a little bit of religion, you know, a lot of paranormal stuff, because that's been basically my life since Corey. Yeah. Um, and, and I am. I, I do psychic medium work and I also do energy work, healing. And you had a balance today. I did have a balance today and it was fantastic. <laughs> I'm I'm still processing it, kind of. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. It's almost like it's kind of a strange experience. It's really, um, it really did feel personal to me. Yes. Yeah. But we talked to your body. Yeah. We talked to your actual beautiful body. Yeah. And your energy. So nobody else will get a balance like that, right? Yeah. But you learned what a meridian is, right? I did. And you know what your chakras are. Yes. And that they are shit right now. Well, no, not, not anymore. anymore. They were when I came in. That. <laughs> <laughs> when I came in, my chakras were all messed up. Right? They were, but they're wide open and beautiful now. So oh. you have rivers of beautiful energy Ooh. running. So you're you're complete and whole. That yeah. makes my heart so happy yeah. right now. <laughs> this is a totally new thing for me. It's so interesting. I love it. I've, you know, I think I reached out to you way before I even knew you were doing the podcast yeah, or you that did. you were a medium or anything. <laughs> I didn't know any of that stuff. Yeah. But I was like, my podcast is about women deconstructing their faith and like going through this process and, and becoming a dissident, meaning like fighting against the system or against yeah. the, that religious, you know, and to just say, Hey, what, you know, this is not what it claims to be. And so that's really why I reached out to you in the beginning. And then you're like, oh, yeah, I have this little podcast. And I'm like, no way. So. And, and basically, that's what I want my podcast to be about, too. One of the, the biggest pet peeves I have about the church mm-hmm. is that it cheats us out of our birthright as a soul Ooh. to have our gifts, our heavenly gifts that God sent us here with. And that's to use all of our senses to communicate with the other side. We all can do it. I'm not anybody special. You can do all the same things I do. I just exercise my muscles. I just showed up. I just got healed energetically so that all of my rivers, that the energy are flowing perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I am a good conduit for the other side, but you can be too. Everybody that's lost somebody, you shouldn't feel that loss so deeply that you just can't go on. You can talk to them. You can feel them. I get a heavenly hug a lot and you can too. So I want people to be empowered by their birthright and be able to claim it and be like, you know what? No religion should take that from you. We all came from the same place. We're all going to the same place. And you know what? We shouldn't judge each other. We should help each other on our journey. Mm -hmm. You don't have to believe what I believe. Mm -hmm. Listen to my stories and take what you love. Whatever you don't love, just let go, you know? Yeah, let it go. But love each other. Bottom line, love each other, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I genuinely feel like when I deconstructed my faith, when I decided I no longer believed and all this stuff, my heart was opened just wide open to like Mm -hmm. a feeling where I could actually love unconditionally. And I didn't know before that I wasn't doing that. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Oh yeah. 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 That's because you came from a place of conditional, conditional love. And when you take that away, now you know what it's like to not be so you have no judgment behind your love. You love people no matter who they are. Yeah. And how freeing is it? Oh, it's so freeing. It's hard to even describe to people how big it feels for me. Like, it's just like my heart just is wide open. Mm-hmm. And I never experienced that before. And now I see like how judgmental, what an asshole I was, like how close minded I was, how this or that. And I... And I mean, I can't help it, but I do feel some regret about the way I parented my kids where it was like very conditional love, like Mm -hmm. do what I say and then I'll love you. Of course, I never said that, but that's the way I behaved. And that was the message they received. I think that's what the church teaches you. Oh, absolutely. Everything is conditional. Everything is shameful or fearful or it's, it's not wrapped around that unconditional love that Christ would show. I mean, Mm -hmm. he, he talked to the sinners, right? You know, he didn't pick and choose, you know, just the righteous people to talk to. Like, I, I just, I think if we can follow him, yeah, we're way better off, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so follow that about. teaching. and Oh, man. Well, I appreciate you so much <laughs> taking the time. I mean, she has spent, like, the whole day with me, for real. She just, 
And she even bought me lunch. What in the world? Okay, I'm oh, buying lunch next you time. You totally are. Um, definitely. Okay, I'm going to remember that. I'm making a mental note. Um, but yeah, I love that I got to meet you and got to know your story and know more about you. And I'm going to be doing more energy healing, body balancing, whatever it's called, and medium stuff. Like, Do it. I'm so interested in all Do of it. it. It's so much fun. And you know what? It's such truth. So I, I'm excited to see your journey and be a part of it. Yeah. Oh, ah. so fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> if you enjoy this content and it's been helpful for you, don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast. Leave us a review if you love us. And finally, if you feel so inclined, I would really appreciate financial support in this work. You can go to dissidentdaughters.org and donate, or you can go to mormondiscussionpodcast.org and choose Dissident Daughters in the drop down menu when you go to set up your donation. You can do a one-time donation or better yet, set up a monthly donation of even five bucks. If you've left the church recently, you've probably experienced a 10% income increase. And here's a place where you can donate and know that you are supporting a fellow dissident daughter who wants to stick around and keep providing a supportive space for deconstructing our faith together. Thanks for all your support.